you know, like I say, oh, that's my process or whatever. But like, I'm always malleable and, and open to, to, to new things. Obviously, you have to be as a producer. You can't just be like, I think a lot of the art of that is lost on some some of the more modern producers. They have a certain way of doing things because they learn. A lot of people are learning through like using presets and using a lot of like shortcuts per se. And it's like, then it's like you don't know how to, well, what do you do if life throws you a curveball? Then you don't know what to do. And it's like, no, you know, if there's one thing that I would teach everybody, like t how, how many times did I do that with you, all you guys in the studio? You know, it's like, here, let's do this. Even with Michael, like, you know, like pre-production, here's this, 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 this. Then we're in the middle of the studio and I go, hey, you know what? Try this. So this week on The Record Process, we have an extra special episode in store for you. We finally found time to catch up with the legendary producer, engineer, and longtime friend of mine, Steve Evitz. Over the last decade, I've worked closely with Steve on more than four full-length studio albums that he has produced with my band, The Wonder Years. The most recent of these is an album called The Hum Goes On Forever, which was just released on September 23rd via Hopeless Records. Given our extended collaborative history, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to discuss his perspective on the evolution of our band through the lens of this most recent release. We talk about how the making of this record combined the strength of a process that has been refined through repetition, the trust that we have in each other, and the reinvigorating addition of new locations and a few helping hands along the way. We reflect on what we've learned from ourselves as a band and how Steve's vast knowledge has helped guide our careers as songwriters, musicians, and performers. The hum would not have been possible without Steve for a number of reasons, and I think you'll feel that after listening to this interview. So here's a note about our sponsors, and then we're off. When the world shut down in 2020, musicians and producers everywhere were forced to re-examine and reimagine their creative process. Without the possibility of in-person studio collaboration, the future of music production was anything but certain. But as the old saying goes, where there's a will, there's a way. And for those professionals who were determined to never compromise on the quality of their audio, the world-class engineers at Audio Movers established that way. By combining the HD streaming of lossless multi-channel audio straight from your DAW with the unique ability to adjust latency and bitrate, Listen To stands as the solution to unlocking global creativity in music production. Its power has been felt on Grammy award-winning albums and on over 85% of all modern Abbey Road studio sessions. So stop letting your physical location dictate the quality of your work and the projects within your reach. For a free trial, just follow the link in our show notes and use the code PROCESS to receive 10% off the first year of your membership. Listen, if you're an artist or musician still struggling to find a better way to distribute and promote your music, and you haven't checked out DistroKid yet, then that needs to jump straight to the top of your to-do list. We are proud to have them back with us for another season of the record process, primarily because they, just like us, are committed to empowering and supporting independent artists like you. DistroKid is by far the most affordable service for distributing your music to all digital streaming platforms, and it comes with a bunch of tools to help you elevate your career in a ton of crucial ways. DistroKid not only allows you to spread your music across the streaming ecosystem, regardless of what platform might be top of your focus right now, but it also helps you share your story with labels using their unique upstream tool. You can engage with your fan base using DistroKid's text messaging feature, and they'll even help you create unique lyric videos that can help you promote your music better online. As a record process listener, you can get 30% off of your first year's membership just by heading to the show notes and signing up using our affiliate link there. And remember, we always love hearing what you're working on and how tools like DistroKid are helping you create some incredible moments for your fan base. So please don't hesitate to share them with us. And now here's our interview. Steve Evitz, welcome to the record process. It seems like it's been a really long year trying to chase this down to put it on the books, but that's because you've been moving and you've been doing a whole lot of stuff. How are 
are you, friend? I'm good. I'm like the elusive Pokemon that you need to collect. Aren't you so, dude? There's no <laughs> way we'll ever catch them all. Uh, absolutely not. But you are on the East Coast now, and you feel both physically I am. and uh, emotionally closer to us, closer than ever before. I do, definitely. Uh, I mean, I'm already, I've already seen you know you guys a bunch on the East Coast, which is great. I forgot how the humidity really, I mean, like we had those days, even like last summer, we're like, man, it's really humid here in California. It feels like the East Coast. And then I'm like, I get back to the East because I'm like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> well, Steve, um, yeah, that was not humidity. I, I mean, I grew up here for, uh, you know, 30 something years. It's like I grew up here and then like, you know, all that time in California and I forgot how chewy the air actually gets in the summer. Yeah, summertime. chewy is a, yeah. So. If you want to see chewy, Steve, come visit me in Atlanta now. I'll show you chewy. <laughs> yeah, well, I've been there. I've I've been to some of those that that uh, that moist Atlanta air. Yeah. Oh, it's good. But anyway, um, all of that aside, before all of those uh, life upheavals and transitional moments came came into play for you, we made. A Wonder Years record together, and I wanted to, the, the stars aligned, uh, one of uh, numerous ones for anybody out there keeping track, and we thought it would be potentially interesting on a number of levels uh, to have you come on, and I mean, there's so many, we we even early on talking about having you come on and, and talk through a record, we, you know, we were jostling around, what, you know, what are we going to do? Do we do some of the Dillinger stuff? There's so much to unpack there. Do we do, you know, some of the old school, like, saves the day, like, the, the old school, like Jersey stuff from your time, you know, out there. It's like, how do we pick one? And then eventually, as it happens, we kind of procrastinated in the perfect amount of time. Then now I was like, wait, <laughs> let's just do the hum goes on forever because uh, now it'll be perfect and the record will be out by the time we're able to get this out. Uh, so here we are. And I'm uh, truly, honestly, so excited to dive in here. And I, I we were talking about where do we kind of begin, because in a way it, it begins a long time ago, right, um, in terms of our relationship with you. But it began a very long time ago. Yeah. I'd love to hear how you see, um, or at least um, from your perspective, how with this record, The Hum Goes On Forever, how that the project started coming coming into the fold and how you saw that kind of coming down the pipeline, having had such uh, a longstanding relationship with us and just a, a continued invested curiosity in, in where we, we kind of grow. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that I can speak for you and, and the guys when during the pandemic, we uh, did break listen out on my feet together via remote via some, some pretty uh, wild you know, new internet technology of like the using like the source nexus yep. thing. And I could actually connect into the retro studios. You know, originally we had talked about doing those two songs right before the pandemic. I ran, I saw you guys at the glass house in Pomona and like, Hey, you know, maybe like April come out and we'll, uh, we'll go through the thing. Not knowing that the entire world would shut down only um, a scant, like five days later. If I, yeah. Like a less than a week later, uh, the shit hit the fan. Yeah. Crazy. And then, so what we wound up doing, we pushed that back and then we wound up, uh, it wound up just, everybody felt more comfortable just doing it via remotely. So I figured out how to set it up with Andy over at Retro Studios. And I was able to, to dial in and actually listen at full fidelity and dial, even help, even dial in tones and like everything. We did even in the pre-production, we, we did pre-production via Zoom with your guys set up at, uh, at home. Yep. And, uh, but it just, even, even over the internet, and even although it was remotely, just the, that 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 synergy that we all had when working together, bouncing ideas off of each other, it already felt right and felt like home. And uh, you know, everybody seemed to love the results we got out of it. And then it's like, okay, well now let's you know, obviously, when it comes time to do a record, let's you know, I hope that we could uh, we could do it again and. and you know, and then you guys, they call me and uh, your management called me and... And it timed out. And that's the other thing, yeah, too, where sometimes it's... I mean, how many times have you just been like like a project chases and you're just like, yo, that would be awesome. And then it comes down and it's like, this is the window we have to do a record. And you're like, I'm away or we're on tour when, you know, so-and-so. It's like, so a lot yep. of it sometimes, you know, it's like 
that like where you want to go does it you know <laughs> so many factors can be at play and that was a thing too where because we were forced to do that remotely yeah it's like we had to test ourselves and, and kind of go into less comfortable waters but because there was already such a familiarity there even you, you know you mentioned kind of doing pre-production uh, on those two songs in Nick's basement I wonder what that was like from your perspective because we you know we almost said it's like hey this is funny that Steve's just a floating head right now uh, you know but in so <laughs> many ways nothing's different where we would but it was there was nothing different I was sitting there listening to everything and I'm bopping along just like I usually do you know and, and then it's like oh hey wait wait let's let's do this let's do that and it was actually great because I wasn't getting barraged by sheer volume in the in a rehearsal room like I usually am I'm listening through my through my system through the monitors going wow I can hear everything super clear and I can I can really hear what everybody's doing in rehearsal just like what you know like later when we did the the pre-production for the hum and we all did it with the in-ear system yep. compared to the other four the other three times where we did it in a rehearsal room and i had earplugs in and i'm like what are you playing hold on casey what are you playing nick what are you playing like you know you couldn't really hear i could hear i could focus on the drums and that's all fine which is usually the, the fo main focus like getting the arrangement right getting the drums right that's like the always the basis of it but this time you could hear every part that everybody's doing and it was just like it was wonderful actually it was like this is like a game changer and i was like now i'm when i do regular standard pre-production in a rehearsal room again i'm gonna be bummed out mm. if we're not on <laughs> in-ears dude you, well and you, and you know what's funny so i remember that too and this is one of the things i think when we came in for suburbia where uh and we have all like gleaned this in our own independent projects since and there's a lot you know there's a clarity that comes from watching someone uh, like yourself that's gone through so many records done that and just being like why are you playing so loud be like it sounds good and just like yeah but it just sounds like mush when your ears are blurring everything out I'm trying to actually hear parts which is absolutely yeah. for anybody that grew up in a garage and was like yo I can't wait to have the 100 watt half stack right and Tom's smiling right now because I know he knows exactly what I'm saying huh? right um, sure. as any guitar player or like great drum smasher that for us is, is uh uh, and I think that, you know, the in-ears was uh, a nice transitional point that, that came with time as well and was an extension of all that. But I remember that being like, be like, I can't even hear the kick drum right now. That's a problem. We need to bring it down until I can actually hear every instrument that's happening, even in just a room, right? And so this was the extrapolation of that. This is the extrapolation of it for sure. But yeah, even later on, like I started doing that where it's like, before I do anything, it's like, okay, let's everybody turn down a little bit. And also, you know, it's, it's, you struggle to find that balance if you're not on ears, but you can get it done. But it's like, okay, wait. Like the, I'll I'll spend an hour just like okay wait turn the bass up all right no you guys all right I can't hear you I can hear you you know like just getting it so I can hear everybody yeah. in the room it's like so important yeah. because how many times even with pre production then it's like you get into the studio it's like what are you You're playing there? Just like the two guitar players talk to each other. <laughs> what are you playing? I'm doing this. Dude, that's you're a half step off from me. I've been doing it like that the whole and, time. And then what? you get the age old you know. battle which is only amplified with three guitar players of well, I've been playing this since like this date at this time. Uh, what about you? Because I think then you wrote your part the next day. So I don't know who's right and who's wrong. But like, right? But you know, yeah. yeah. But right. But you don't. Have, you know, you have to know when to pick and choose the battles right. and when to plant your right, flag. Right. Totally. And that's <laughs> this is my which, part. And that is, um, <laughs> like, you know, and we'll get into that. Believe me, because I definitely, uh, I know we get asked a ton, and Tom brought it up too, and made sure that we will touch on it. The three guitar players. Uh, thing that can be madness, not just um, in general, but especially in like a pre-production setting and or figuring out how to place them and choosing your battles has been a, an evolutionary, uh, you know, gro growing space for us, uh, for Matt, Nick and I, too. But um, yeah, so I, I wanted that's actually a really good point then, too. And I'm glad we touched on that, Steve, because the, the evolution of even just the pre-production process and the amount of clarity we get through that with with you and the records that we've done this was the one where we had the most clarity at that stage probably absolutely i mean i think like you know even on the previous on no closer to heaven is really where you guys really came into your own 
with like, okay, the three guitar players really finding space for everybody's part. Whereas like, you know, Suburbia, it was just, you know, everybody was jockeying for position and, and even so much, it's different on Greatest Generation because there, there were, there were moments of that, but you know, because there's a lot of different songs on that too. And there was a maturity and the thing that happened that it was starting that way. And then, you know, like everybody got pedal boards and everybody got, right. you know, everybody started exper experimenting with like, you know, sonic, you know, landscapes and like trying to figure out where parts fit in. And like, you know, it really started to really come in, to me, it started really coming on its own on, on No Closer to Heaven. And then, you know, the evolution of it on this record yeah. too. And obviously the stuff you guys did, on Sister Cities without me, like, you know, to, to dealing, like, same thing with just really, like, delving into, like, the uh, the shoegazy sonic landscape kind of thing that, you know, that really incorporated, uh, we incorporated a lot of that on this record, but in a different way where the this record's a lot a lot higher energy than than the previous one. Yeah, there's a I think um in just a different thing. It's just a different thing, but like, you know, it basically like taking where you went with like that stuff on on you know, like you know, even like Rainy and Kyoto or anything like that like off the, off the last record uh but then now we 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 married it with like some of the you know, I think doing the breakless and out on my feet and like kind of almost rediscovering, not saying like, oh, we're a pop punk band again, but but saying like the energy. And that that's the thing that I think that, you know, like people go, oh, you know, you can't have a band that doesn't grow up. And I, you, you should, obviously, bands are mature. You're older. You're not 22 anymore. You know, you're not going to be a pop punk band the way you were at 22. It's a different thing. However, the thing that I love about that genre is just the just the energy and the impact of things that marry to the the marry the music to the words right. and like we we're just talking about before we started like that ending of low tide that just came right. out today you know those words are so f freaking powerful and it's just like so when i hear those words and that's that's one of the things in the process of of in pre-production that has always been a, a a really wonderful thing with this band is that, you know, pretty much Soup comes in with a good chunk of the lyrics f almost fully realized, or at least the outline or like the idea of what he wants to convey already formed. And then, so, you know, to me, when we're working on the arrangement, especially the drums, and it's like, it's got to play off the vocal. It always plays off the vocal. It always plays off of the words, especially with a band like this, that the words are so important that it's got to match and it, it, sh it should match that 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 feeling it's going to meet that moment it's got to meet the moment right the music has to rise to the occasion of what that thing is and that vocal is you know i'm exploding on re-entry like i mean like when you hear that i go Ugh, i just want to like you know <laughs> you know that energy i want to keep that energy up and that's that's the thing i love about this type of music and it's always connected with me i don't care how old i get that 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 feeling that runs through it is something that i'll never get tired of dude and i think it, it comes to exactly that so you've used the words like finding those moments and i think you know talking back to the guitar and everything you know over the course of a number of records for us it, there's a restraint that actually helps us nail those moments even better than maybe we did before and that's something you sure. get out of and yes the you know this genre and any of the subgenres attached to it are known for that energy but also i think what we pride our sure. band on and working and getting in the space um you know with collaborators like you is how do we really nail this moment like no like we've never nailed a, the, a moment before because you can write the you can do the same song mm -hmm. in like a shoegaze fashion that lyric turns into a completely different thing and you don't have that desperation that you know that we were like that that was at the forefront of you know even before it gets to that pre-pro right that's where you know that's the intent where he comes in and we say yeah we <laughs> we know we we hear you belting this before we even we know we have to be there in a support way to drive that home sonically so yeah it's great i mean we set the bar 12 years ago with the end the, the end of come out came out swinging it's like you set the bar it's like okay 
here's the, you know, here's the uh, moment. And it's like, okay, there we go. Now we got, now we got to, there's, there's the, there's the one bar that was like instantly we threw down the gauntlet. Okay. Now we got to get to that, you know, to that thing. We're always chasing that, you know? So on the previous records, not sure where drums and bass were tracked, but Case was telling me on, on Hum, there's a special studio that y'all track drums and bass at. Yeah, we went to uh, Studio 606, which is the Foo Fighters studio. It's out in the valley, Deep Valley. It's not open to everybody. I was fortunate enough to, to get hooked up with, with the, the staff there. And I, I've made like seven records there. Or parts of seven records there. Yeah. So it's it's uh it's great and it's it, you know and I used to, uh, back in the day back in the early aughts in the late nineties I worked out of Sound City a lot before it closed mm. on that on that Neve console so I got to got reunited with that that board and it's uh it's great it's a massive drum room great sound and control room you know really good outboard gear but it's really that that room and that 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 old Neve. Because that's the that that particular Neve is only there are only four of those ever made, and that one particularly originally at Sound City was commissioned by Rupert Neve himself, and it's a it's a special it had specialty modules that were only uh, that were basically uh, unique to that particular console wow. that Keith Keith Olson the the house engineer one of the house engineers at Sound City in the seventies who uh, did like Fleetwood Mac and like a million other Tom Petty and a million other records. Um, he had a specific thing on that console that designed that the, the, the controls were all stepped. The volume controls were all stepped for, for recallability. Mm. So there's every, everything when you turn it, it's not just a concentric, like on any standard Eve module, it's all click, 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 click. So you could go, Oh, three clicks, three clicks at 10 K three clicks at, you know, like, Mm. Yeah, it's awesome. So, Such it's a wild. legendary board. So, so cool. I mean, even and one of the things that blew me away uh, on top of all the history and the lineage and the stories in that board and how it got there are the fact that then everything comes full circle with Grohl, the picture of Grohl's kit uh, and the Nevermind setup, which is <laughs> like the old bass drum case, like tunneled out and just mm-hmm. like a bunch of 57s sitting right there on the board that tracked it um, is really such a cool thing. And I love that they they had that there along with everybody that's like signed the board over the years well the sign the board thing most of that sign board thing on the left was um was from the sound city documentary that was all the people that passed through to to record at 606 for the sound city documentary we like mccartney and stevie nicks yeah and i think that was a really listening back especially to to this record um verse like tom mentioned so the other records you know we we done dr- uh, had have done drums at your spot in Omen Room, right? And which is a very different talk about the you know the differences between the two of those because I think this is what I love getting into the weeds on in terms of time, place, situation because it was just so happened where we've been working with you for a very long time. We've made a lot of records there. This is the first one where your career mm-hmm. had brought you to working out of that spot. And I think when we started talking about doing this record, it was you who was like, "Listen, Case." Guys, 606. I think we got to try and make it happen. You know, like, and we were like, oh, of course, like that. That's a cool, uh, you know, idea to us. And we made it happen. But well, just wanted just wanted something different than like to come back to the to my place and do the drums in the same room. I just figured like, if it wasn't 606, I would have suggested like you know Ocean Studios or I would have suggested you know going to Cello or something. Just a different room. I just wanted to try a different room. I know you guys did like Sunset Sound for uh, Sister Cities. I just thought like it would be cool to just you know track her in a, in a in a bigger room like the Omen room stuff. I always got good drum tones yeah. out of it, but it's you know it's just you know I, I like I said I had done a bunch of records at six oh six recently, and I just loved that room and I loved that board and I was just like you know it was more of like let's just do it let's just go here it'll be great you know it'll be a different ex- different experience because I just wanted to start the start the album off on a slightly different foot more than anything. 
Yeah. Not that we couldn't have tracked drums at my place. We could have tracked drums and it would have been awesome. And I think there's an energy to that, right, Steve? And there's like a thing because we have such a history. I think that's a that's a really well thought out choice, too, because you've seen and you've worked with a bunch of bands for repeat records. And there's a reason. And I think this is something, too, where it's like uh, I think that was a, re a really intuitive suggestion to shake some things up and say, hey, we want this to feel new and feel evolved. And that was even just for us being there, starting and kicking things off in a different spot, it, it, it did have a, an excitement to it for us that I think we loved and thrived on. Yeah, and then and then also the other thought was, originally the other thought was to like track, track drums and bass to tape. Mm. That was the first thought. But then, you know, obviously we had changed, even what we did on this record evolved because originally we were going to do the full record together and then you were going to do a separate EP with, with Will Yip and then also the Christmas single. That was like the whole thing. It was like, we're going to do album, EP, Christmas single. So then you guys came to me and was like, well, you know, we're kind of at a block now. We, we, we need to really get this thing going. And we're kind of like out of time. So we're going to use the three songs with Will and put that on the record and you'll do the rest of it. And it's like, okay. Yeah. But, you know, we originally had more time booked at 606. We were yeah. going to do like two weeks at 606. And I was going to do drums and bass to tape and then dump everything in Pro Tools. And I was like really into that, that whole concept. But, you know, as, as, as things happen, things evolve, things change, and you adapt and you move on. Yeah. And, and you know what? And what's interesting, too, is like the way that that all came together. Tom and I were just talking about this when we were kind of like outlining, um, you know, some places that, that we wanted to make sure we touched on with this. And that is a really interesting one because this was the first time. And I think part of it was, uh, you know, definitely due to us as a band and not really knowing our timeline, being unsure of touring and everybody's unsure of their timelines. And Right. No, ex exactly. That's how I know that's what happened was the, you guys were, you know, kind of up against it and we were thinking like because originally the tour, the fall tour was right. supposed to happen and then, you know, we were going to do this and then also Soupy you know, uh, Soupy's uh, son was being born, and it was like it was just a lot of like oh, we're up against it, and now we we don't have enough time to write those extra three songs. Right, right, and and well, and, and it was partially that, and partially yeah, it's like conceptually too. And we've talked about this, you know, um, we've kind of let this out of the bag, um, you know, to people already that you know clearly some of those songs, uh, you know, that we did at Studio Four were very. Uh, Philadelphia nostalgia centric. So that was the idea there. And then we love them and realized that they, they also worked in conversation in their own way on the hum. Uh, but we were like, well, we've already <laughs> started them and they're, you know, um, so it was an interesting thing where normally it's like the things that wouldn't necessarily have been how we draw it up because, you know, we are, uh, very much, um, a start to finish, uh, cohesive record band, right? That's always been how we view things. So, um, I think it would only take a set of circumstances like that and all of that uncertainty and life happening in its own way to, um, have led to that point too, which is, I, I think a really interesting note that Tom was like, dude, you got to make sure you, you know, you touch on that. Cause I think that's so different from everything else. Um, but I think it's, it's worked out in a really nice way. And so, uh, the other thing when we're, if we're talking about 606, right. Um, and, uh, I've always loved, and uh, I know a lot of people have learned a lot from your process and you as a bass player, the way you treat bass tracking in your process and the way you view it and even where you place it sometimes. And even that changed on this record specifically. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it sure did. Because, uh, I mean, back in the day, it was always track the drums, track the bass, then track the, you know, get the rhythm section down, then track the guitars, then, you know, like, uh, but then, like, I don't know when it was that I started to do, eh, I think it was probably like, maybe, like, oh God, 15, 20 years, whatever it was, but it was like figuring out the track bass after the guitars, I, it was a lot of, you know, it, it, a lot of it, I mean, it stemmed from a, a bunch of different things, but, you know, sometimes it's out of necessity when I would work with certain bands that, you know, and, and the lower tunings yep. that you wind up track the bass and then you track the guitars and you're like, why does everything sound out of tune? Because the bass, the tuning's so low that, and the bass player's like pressing too hard and my, everything's sharp. And then it's like, uh, you know, then 
you know, you go back and what you use auto tune bass. So like that sounds like poop. So don't do that. So we got to retract the bass anyway. So we retract the guitars first, and then the bass. You can hear the tuning on the bass better when you know because when it's that low, when you're using these, a lot of these low low tunings, it's just like what note is this? <laughs> you can't really even tell, and it's just like. <laughs> It was just, it was kind of out of necessity, but then I also found out that McCartney used to track his bass after the guitars on the Beatles stuff. I'm like, well, if it works for Paul. <laughs> it's probably worth a shot. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that. It's probably worth a shot. You know, he, he had a he had some success. And then also, it was it, I, I like the fact that you could, you know, especially if you have like a bass player, like not so much, well, and even in, in the pop punk stuff, like, you know, someone like Josh is just a great player and like doing all this melodic stuff that you can kind of weave around. And it's like the bass is like the kind of like the shoelace that threads through everything. And then that was the, that's kind of the concept. But on this record, because of necessity, Josh was moving. He had to, he's like, I got to track the bass before and I got to get the hell out and then come back yeah. at the end. So, we tracked the drums and the bass at 606 and then went back to the own room to do all the overdubs. How was that for you then in being able to do that and see the and finally see the rhythm section come together and in that room in that control room like that too because it was great. It was awesome. You know, and I uh, I'm never, you know, the thing is, you know, like I say, oh, that's my process or whatever, but like I'm always malleable and, and open to, to, to new things. Obviously, you have to be as a producer. You can't just be like, I think a lot of the art of that is lost on some some of the more modern producers. They have a certain way of doing things because they learn. A lot of people are learning through like using presets and using a lot of like shortcuts per se. And it's like, then it's like you don't know how to, well, what do you do if life throws you a curveball? Then you don't know what to do. And it's like, no, you know, if there's one thing that I would teach everybody, like t how, how many times did I do that with you, all you guys in the studio? You know, it's like, here, let's do this. Even with Michael, like, you know, like pre-production, here's this, 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 this. Then we're in the middle of the studio and I go, hey, you know what? Try this. You have to be able to like adapt and to the curveballs because that's just life in general. Like, just like me, like I have to be able to adapt to the curveballs. So you have to... You know, you have to be malleable to know, okay, this isn't working. So, and it's like, okay, here's, the, here's these three other ways we can try it because you have to. Taking a minute here to shout out our good friends at Sheet Happens Publishing. Back with us again for season three. They are a company that works directly with artists to create accurate and immersive tab books, vinyl, and other merch that allows fans to get one step closer to perfecting the soundtrack of their lives. As many of you may know, I had the pleasure of working side by side with them to put together a book for my band, The Wonder Years. And believe me, they are incredibly thorough and always dedicated to artist approved accuracy in every one of their books. Every tab book comes with the accompanying guitar profiles, which allow you to jump right into playing along with all of your favorite tracks. So all you need to do is head over to SheetHappensPublishing.com to check out everything they have to offer and be sure to enter the code TRP15 at checkout for 15% off your first purchase. Or you can find the link in our show notes. And again, that's promo code TRP15 there's so many parallels with a lot of other entertainment and artistic like creative disciplines but the the one thing uh, that I have been coming back to a lot recently that, that kind of speaks to what you're saying Steve I think is um, in a lot of the ways uh, that uh, actors kind of interact and, and go through a scene and with a great director that director will be the first one to say if you feel something go with it and that's like the sign of like um, you know you have a script but a, a great director is not going to just be like, nope, he didn't. He's supposed to say the family, not families. He's not he's not going to say cut, stop. If it's compelling, they're going to let it go and see and chase that idea in the moment. You have to roll with the punches, you know, like it's a, you know, you have to it's almost like the you have to be a good like the actors who do right. improv. You have to. Yes. And right, totally. You have to just say, yeah. say yes. You have to. Yes. And. 
no matter what. And you're working off that you're working off what's come before it instead of trying to like fit everything into a predetermined piece. No, this is the pre-programmed thing and don't deviate from this pre-programmed destination. I cannot do that. Oh no, don't compute. You know, like you can't, you can't, that's just ridiculous. You can't Tom's do it. Tom's working with a client right now that we were just talking about that literally came in. Tom had drums cut for him. Everything was, you know, sounding nice. He's like, I think I want to change the genre of the song. That's maybe a, you know, that's a different conversation, but at least there's an artistry where it's like, hey, honestly, I realize now that I actually want it to sit and live a little bit like this, you know? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, a, a, a great song, if it's a great song, you can do it in a million different genres totally. and it'll still translate. Bingo. Totally. All right. So we have drums and bass cut. Studio 606 was a wild time. We loved it. Now, you took it back to Omen Room for guitars and overdubs and uh, overdubs and with everything. Yep. And for the first time, well, actually not necessarily for the first time, but not necessarily, not for the first time, not out of desperation, <laughs> we ran both rooms simultaneously at all times with uh, the band's uh, live sound engineer who also runs Retro Studios, uh, Retro City Sound, Andy Clark. That's right. Enter Mr. Andy Clark. There's another band that was in the that's in the control room in the A room at the, at the own room now. This band called Common Kings. They're like a pop uh, reggae band. They're actually, they're actually pretty pretty damn popular. They're a, they're a Grammy nominated band. Whatever. They they were supposed to be on tour, but the pandemic happened, obviously. So we actually paid them to go away, <laughs> <laughs> so we could take both rooms over. And so we set up two rooms, like a bunch of guitar cabinets in both rooms, mm -hmm. set up, brought, brought some of my preamps and stuff in, into their room, so, like the whole nine yards, like got so two dual setups and we just ran both rooms simultaneously at all times. Just let the fire fly. But I'll say it, that's the first time intentionally <laughs> that <laughs> right. happened. Right, right. Every other record... Right, we played it that way this time. <laughs> every other record was out of desperation. Shit, we need to get into the A room. We set up Nick in the live room in the A room after the fact and, like, doing harmonies or we did the gang right. vocals over there or, like, you know, we always had to do something because the other records we had, like, what did we do Suburbia in? Like, total, total amount of tracking. I think it was 17 days... It was under three weeks uh, by, you know, by a good amount for sure. Pretty sure 17 days was Suburbia. And then we had this guy, this guy, Darian Rundle, who we, we sent, I said, Josh yeah. away to, 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 to track some bass, you know, because they were, you guys were leaving for Good Charlotte? UK, yeah, with the Kerrang Tour. UK, right. Good Charlotte, yeah. UK, right. So it was like, oh my God, we got to get done. Oh God, oh, we don't have time. Oh God, we got to call up my friend Darian. Hey, can you track some bass? Sure. Go over there, Josh. Bye. You know, Dara Josh. Like, I don't know who this guy is. Oh, you know. <laughs> so it's always happened where there's been like the, the mad scramble of the last three days. Like, shit, we got to set up somewhere. Mm. Nick was upstairs in the lounge doing keyboard overdubs, and like, you know, they even on Suburbia, I think he tracked some stuff at 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 the house yeah. at the Seal Beach house, and then we reamped it. You have to adapt. We were tracking everywhere and at all kinds of weird hours for a lot of those records. And this was the first one. And those other ones weren't necessarily for a lack of trying. They were just for a lack of time, resources, whatever it might be. This was the first one where we were like, hey, we've learned some lessons. Let's do this and get ahead of it. Right. And this was the first time we were like, if we're going to do this, Let's find a way to get um, to get all of those things in place, because there's always going to be an 11th hour thing. But let's make sure that it's not that that we at least try to account for that. And so that that brought um, brought in Andy, like you mentioned, who and because you've you've brought other people that you've worked with and trusted. And we uh, Alan, we went and did some tracking with Alan uh, over, you know. No, sure. But the Andy thing was because of the of the remote thing we did. Right for break listening out of my feet and I liked uh, it just the me and Andy and Andy took a lot of great Andy took direction from me very well and it was just it was super easy and he's super chill and I was just like okay and the fact that you guys went through how many tours with him right. and it was so easy and it was just like okay this makes the this makes absolutely perfect sense so now let's go in there and like let's get let's track like you know Let's get so far ahead of it that now we can then step back 
with the, with the extra time in the, in both rooms and go, what does this need, mm. and what do we do to go the extra mile to make right. this more special, as opposed to, oh my god, we gotta finish, let's go, well, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> look how many more boxes we have to check in like the uh, so few hours. <laughs> oh my god, the chart's so empty. The chart's so empty. That's because like that precedent and foundation of trust, both for you to bring someone in that you wouldn't have other otherwise known, right? Um, like pulling somebody off the street into a big project like this is not something you're going to do. Um, and that's the point I kind of wanted to make, too, is there was a trust that obviously we had built with Andy being on the road with him so much and him knowing all of us as people and having had already deal with us at our uh, to deal with us at our best and worst. Right. And he happened to then also be able and available to make the time to come out, too, which was also, you know, part of part of all of that and figuring out who we could pull in. And we we're like, well, what if we just fly Andy out. Cause I remember having those conversations and you always try to like the simple hope that like maybe the simplest source is like, Oh, there's a guy across the hall or there's so-and-so in an open room that I can probably get to engineer that room. And then we were like, wait a second, that thing that we all kind of did with Andy was great. Well, Alan, Alan Hessler, who I trust, who I trusted implicitly, yeah. but wasn't even, he's like out of the game right. for the most part. Right. And then like I had tried a couple other guys for like editing work and remote work and it's just, just wasn't happening. <laughs> when we crunched the numbers and realized that we could actually bring Andy out and that was feasible, we were like, well, that's kind of a no brainer then because <laughs> Steve loves him already, you know? Right. And I, and I liked it. Right. And I think uh, I was like, you know, Andy's awesome. And then, you know, originally the thought when we first started talking about the process of this record, making this record was like, Hey, I'll come to Philly. We'll do it at retro. Great. You know, like no problem. But everybody's like, no, we want to get the hell out. I'm like, okay. Come on True. out. And then that's when I thought of the idea of 606. No, totally. And so, and it really was effective. Um, and maybe that's a great uh, opportunity too, because a lot of that uh, admittedly is due to the number of members that play instruments with six strings um, <laughs> that creates um, a wealth of necessity. It Harmonically dense case. Yeah, that, cre that creates um, some harmonically dense situations. Well put, Tom. <laughs> and so let's go into that, too, because um, we try to... Uh we try to not to go like too gear heavy uh, in this show, Steve, because there's a million shows that, that do that way better uh, than we probably ever could. But I think it does bear mentioning uh, that this time around, because we had that extra time, we were able to kind of throw a bunch of toys in the live room and assemble some some cool guest stars uh, when it comes to guitar tracking. And I know people are always like, what is the guitar tracking process like? How do you do it? I'd love you to just speak to that because I think you have a cool, really unique 10,000 foot view having been um, on that other on the other side of the, the glass and kind of trying to wrangle so much of that and see the, the whole picture. Mm hmm. Well, that, you know, not not going too much into the gear thing, but we really experimented with a lot of different amps this time. And we always had a little bit of variety of amps, but, you know, you know, the early record was like, you know, you had your Jew, Matt Bresch had his 60, 6505, and then Nick had his, the trainer, I think, is what we wound up using. Was he, was that the trainer, the top hat? I know he used the trainer on a bunch. Uh, I can't remember. No, I'm thinking of like Suburbia. Was it the Carvin or the Trainer? Was it a Carvin or a Trainer? He had the Carvin back then. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much he used it uh, or what shape it was in, but yeah. Right. But so uh, on this record, because of the nature of the songs and everything like that, and then, you know, we had a bunch of amps at our disposal here, and then I wound up borrowing some other amps uh, from my friend Joe Barisi, another producer. You can refer to him as his, uh, his known name, Evil Joe. Uh, Evil Joe. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, we wound up getting, you know, through through his affiliations with like uh, Brian Carson. So Carson amps. We wound up using that, and we wound up using a Wizard. We wound up using this PV. You know, we just it was it was fun to like you know play you know Sonic Legos basically, and like see which what pieces fit with what, and uh, you know like I would go back and say, hey, what's Casey doing in here? And I'd say, okay, well let's let's try this. And then since you're using this, we'll use this because that's a brighter amp and then that's a darker amp. And then, you know, like it, from just from a sonic standpoint, just to like not only the, the parts and the arrangements, but sonically to make things 
so they weren't so they could really stack on top of each other and make a bigger sound without you know like sometimes especially with three guitar players you know if there's if the sounds are too similar they're going to wind up there's always going to be wind up weird phasey things and comb filters and stuff like that where things sat, like frequencies start canceling each other out and then it actually makes things smaller and it's like the idea was to make everything as big as possible obviously just because the, the band makes a big you know makes a big joyous noise and i wanted to make sure that it always yeah got to that you know dude i love sonic legos let's uh let's put that on a t-shirt um as the the flagship steve evitz line um but uh no dude you're totally right but it's true because like and even even to the fact of like okay so you're using the jube that's el34 so let's use make sure that nick uses a 6l6 right. amp and then let's you you know like let so there's always that 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 difference that happens which leads me to one of my favorite um self coin phrases the with is in the diff <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> uh, wait, I, dude, you knew I was uh, going to get one in here, Tom. Act like you're surprised, dude. Um, <laughs> I'll act like I'm surprised, Casey. But I, <laughs> but I, I know you're it. not, Steve. But you're a good friend because you let me get it out. Oh, yeah. um, because you gave me you yes. gave me the space. Um, wow. But uh, but no, like all jokes aside, the Sonic Legos thing is is so cool. And I think part of that, uh, especially at the start, is before we even you know tracked a single note. All we had were like the live scratch scratches that we did uh, at 606, we brought everything that we kind of had assembled in and had a big, loud listening party and auditioned all of these things. So we knew what colors we were dealing with. And we knew, ah, I thought we were going to really like that one. It's the thing that I do all the time with dialing in guitar tones. I did that creative live class some years yep. back and uh, I discussed literally that thing. And it's basically like, it's kind of nerdy and scientific, but it's like you use it basically. It's like here's the control. The control is this guitar head. Okay, so now this head through this cabinet. Now this cabinet. Now this cabinet. Okay, it sounds good with this cabinet and this cabinet, but not through this one. So we know that this head works great with this these two cabinets, and not the third one. Yep. You know, and then so on and so forth. And then which guitar with that head in that cabinet? And then, you know, like, so you just basically, you leave one thing constant and switch out the other things mm -hmm. until you find the right one. And then, the, then you have the two things and then even the third element of guitar or whatever or pedals. And then you go, so then you get to that point where you arrive once you're locked here, locked here, then you switch out and find out the, which one works the best with all of them. And it was just basically trying to optimize stuff. But then, you know, we also did wind up, wind up retracking certain things because it's like okay well that doesn't now it doesn't work with the other right. two things on top of it so you, you know you run into those things and again you have to be malleable you can never be you know me my whole thing with with records is because i grew up making records on analog tape is commit 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 i can't say it enough commit to the stuff don't go well let's leave an open option for later it's like why 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 are you gonna why are you gonna do five takes of this guitar solo and playlist it? No. Did you like it before? Are you gonna like it five, you know uh, ten days from now? Probably not. So commit to the one and that's it. But you have to be malleable or pliable or whatever or flexible enough to know when things aren't working, don't try to like, you know, you know, if you're outside and it's raining, don't be mad at the sky. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Put on, wear, get an umbrella. Like, <laughs> change it, change it, and and deal with it. Get some Flex Seal. You know, that's simple. Yeah. Get some Flex Seal, part of yeah. the Flex Seal family of products. Exactly. Um, just, well, just slap it. Right <laughs> on. Slap it right on. Uh, no problem. You're good to go, dude. You're totally right. And th that's it. And this is a thing where when we've been in it, actually, it kind of um, reminds me of a few instances. And I saw all, like all three of us doing this at any given time, where you have to <laughs> like be. Or like, how do you do the three guitars thing? It comes down to not being selfish as a player because it's not about it can't be. your tone and the best tone. And especially if you're going first, sometimes it's like, well, I think it needs to be bigger. It doesn't need to be thicker. And you're like, let's think about what's going. I mean, I'm saying, you know, yeah, you went first on a couple of things on this record. And then like afterwards, like case, it's not working. Sorry, we got to recut it. Everybody on this record had had things that they they get cut and then had right. to recut because it's like, sorry. It's not working right now. Here you go. 
and that was the biggest thing or even in the moment where it's like that's why you don't record in solo it's why you don't mix in solo because it's all about like hey if you try and dial in this perfect pristine thing and then pop it in the mix in the track you're like oh cool then you do have like this bloated like low end thing and it's like way but like blowing out the high end because the other guitar was even brighter than this one but you wanted yours like to sound perfect and pristine it's like you can't do that with three guitars yep. you got to be like it's the well with guitars or with whatever it's just you have to be it's not you got to remember it's not always about just you right yeah. and that's Never. i mean i mean i'm i'm dealing with i deal i just dealt with this this project i'm working on and i'm doing these these uh this vocal and there was an existing track and there was this low singing voice that goes underneath it and we're cutting a new vocal on on it like next week and the one guy was like well why doesn't he just sing to that low track i'm like no it's the lead vocal <laughs> so let the lead vocal do what it's going to do and then retract that low vocal to match the lead vocal you're not going to try and force that lead vocal with all its character which is the most important thing to match the backing vocal it's it's ridiculous yeah. Like it's not a you know you, the backing vocalist is making it about him and it's like n no that's that's completely yeah you're not gonna have a thicker brighter backup harmony you know like um, yeah yeah right exactly it's like uh, no recut the lead vocal and now recut the backing right, vocal to right. match it sorry well, well Steve I, I want to get into like what qualifiers when you're getting like tones and such especially for for this record with the three guitars when are you like yep this is the tone. And like, I, I know that it's like, we were just talking about how malleable it is, but like at least getting the baseline down, like what is the qualifier? It's different every time. Yeah. It, it's more of it's like just, a feel thing. It, it's, it's a feel thing. Yeah. It's just, a, yeah. I, I, you know, I do so much of what I do. The best results I've ever gotten on any record I ever gotten, I've ever done has generally been where I'm, I'm trusting my gut mm. and I can't stress that enough. Like that's just how I work, but it's just, you know, people always, you know, again, like on, on other things, I've online classes or people ask me about things and it's like, how do you get this guitar tone? I'm like, honestly, I turn knobs till it sounds good. I move the mic yeah. till it sounds good. It's just like, it's just, it's that simple. And I'm just trusting, you know, all the years of experience I have to go, that feels right. That's it. Yeah, totally. I can't get too cerebral about it. I mean, there's obviously a cerebral element to, of it, mm -hmm. but I, I just, you know, all the, all the, the thought and the, the stuff I learned basically just goes now. It's just like the, my 10,000 hours or whatever you want to call it. It's just now going to like, just by that feels right cool yeah and you are you already clocked all the information of like okay this this cab goes with this head this guitar and all that and it's just it's just going that's really it like we we got there and it's and it's also yeah and then and again yeah. like you go oh well this cab like and then somebody who's learning how to play guitar they go oh they use that karsten's head with that cabinet that guitar player has a completely different touch yeah yeah, yeah. And it's not going to sound the same yeah, coming yeah. off of his hands because the yeah. tone comes from your hands. Totally. Like totally. that's on that's on everything. The tone comes from your hands on drums. The tone comes from your hands. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, like you, you, you feel the way like the way Michael Kennedy hits and like he's, it's a different thing. But if someone else got on Michael Kennedy's kit and played the same song, it's not going to sound the same. The tone's going to be completely different. They're going to come in and be like, Steve, what have you been doing? This sounds terrible. It's like, yeah, because it's all queued up for Michael. Like it's, you know what I mean? It's everything set for Michael. The way I tune the drums, the way I'm, the way I'm tuning the drums, it's, it's based on the way he, he hits it. It's like, you, you know, how many times I go, Hey, can you hit that? Okay, wait, no, here, let me get back there and I'll yeah. just do something, you know, like, because it's, it's, it's just, you're, you're adjusting it to the player. Right. Yeah. It all comes from the player. And that's why I'm so, I'm so, you know, you saw me early on. I didn't need to do it later on because you guys are all like, you know, it's a different thing. You evolved as players. But like early on, I'd be like, hey, hey, wait, no, pick this this way or move your hand or, or like, you know, stand up when you're playing or sit yeah. down or, you know, like whatever. It's just like, it's all that stuff because it comes from the source. It com The source is the source. Whether the source is like dealing with the guitar amp, the source is the player. The ultimate source is the player. Right, totally. And that's, that's why I so... And such a stickler for for performance 
early yeah. on. Mm-hmm. And then later, it's just, it's, you know, but it's not even a thing of, it's not about perfection ever. Perfection is boring and it's sterile and it sucks. It's never about perfection. It's about what feels good. Love that. Dude, and that's why I want, um, for the same reason, people are like, well, what what guitar, what amp did you use on this? What amps? Like, I'm like, that is so not important when it comes to like, it's like you'd never get the same sound in a million years, even if you tried to line up the exact source. Never. When people ask like, um, you know, Nick threw out um, some of his like presets or people are like, what are your like, you know, your Helix patches, your effects? I'm just like, I mean, you can have them. They're pretty much worthless if you want it to sound exactly like that part sounds on the record, because it sounds that way because I dialed it in playing as hard as I play. If you play different, you got to adjust the gain and the compression to fit that. So exactly. It's just the same. It's the same way that, you know, people write me and go, what compressor setting would you use on a screaming vocalist? I'm like, uh, okay. That's, they just, everybody wants the preset, like the quick fix. And it's just like, um, what kind of music is it? Is it a male singer? Is it a female singer? What mic did you use? Did you use a dynamic? Right, did you use a right. condenser? Was it handheld? What's the, you know, like, I mean, there's like so many variables and it's like adjust it to the the, the singer, yeah. adjust it to the player, adjust the amp to the player, adjust the drum tuning to the player. And not only that, to the song. That's right. Totally. And like, you know, is it a slow song? Is it a fast song? Like, it's just, there's so many things that I don't think about it like until I t- like stuff like this where you deconstruct it slightly, but you know, but all those things and all the years of experience that I have have led me to just go, oh, this is what I should do, uh, kinda. You know, well, like, and you, I just you know what it is. You're you're like someone will come to you with a question of like, what compressor should I use on this? And you're just like, you just gave me one question. I'm gonna give you twenty better questions that are actually the questions exactly. that you've trained your mind to run in rapid succession. So it's um, you know, mm-hmm. and it's it's getting to those questions of like, well. Does he have like a really shrill voice? Does he have a really like low guttural voice? You know, exactly. it's like asking the better questions. Exactly. Um, on that on that note, actually talking about vocalists too, because you always have some conversations, uh, obviously with soup ahead of time. And you mentioned the lyrics and I always love that, um, you and, and part of, um, something that's always important to you is printing out and looking at the lyrics while you're doing vocals, staying, you know, and, and really making, uh, intentional notes about those parts. Well, in pre-production as well, like soup would give me the vocals beforehand, which was great. It was like, so it's so helpful because the, again, the vocal is the driver, obviously, in this band. Like, obviously, everybody's important, but those vocals are what the you know what the people connect to. The emotional thing that's that's what they're the primary is what they're going to latch onto, and always making sure that the drums serve that vocal, making sure the guitar serves that vocal. It just it always it it has to happen that way, because that's what give, is going to give the music it's emotional weight and it's gravitas and it's just you know yeah it's the it's the narrator and we're like we're changing the scenes around the narration you know you're changing the scenes around like the vocal informs everything you know again that's why the band works so well because we're we're really it's it everything is serving that when he came to you right so it, like you mentioned he you know always has like a pretty uh flushed out concept right and so you've seen him come to you um with uh sets of lyrics for a number of records now i'm curious how that uh relationship changed on this record or what might have been different for any reason for you that you that you remember um in terms of how it came to you how you worked through it well i don't remember it being that much different uh i mean there was a lot of like just yeah i i honestly like that's that's one thing that felt fairly consistent from record to record like uh, like Soup and I definitely had have a have a really good, you know, almost a almost a uh, a shorthand now at this point, and I I've only have achieved that with a few singers, the, the like a few few artists where I, we have like a, a really a, a almost a, like I said a shorthand where it's just like he knows what I'm looking for, he knows when I want to push him, and he knows when I'm when I'm telling him when I'm pushing him to do the thing, then he's going to deliver it. Cause I know it's like, come on, man, open it up. Let's go. You know, like, yeah. 
he just knows what I'm looking for. And, you know, like, you know that this part, man, this part, let's, let's look at these lyrics, man. This just, you got like, like the end of low tide, like, man, just like, like open it up, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. those, those vocals, you know, the one who, the one who ruins yep. everything. It's just like, ah, it's just like, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. You know, like it's just so good. Those moments are just like, I live for those moments. Were there any other, um, I call them like kind of goosebump moments, um, that you remember or moments that you really like had to push or, I mean, I, obviously I know it's tough, but it's just what, what also I think is interesting. And for good reason too, we're not always in the room a hundred percent of the time while you're tracking vocals, actually quite the opposite as years have gone on and records have gone on because we, I think we trust each other more when you're younger, you're like, how's it going to sound? Is it going to be cool? Like, I hope, you know, whatever, I'm worried about this change. And now we're just like, nope, I know that like, if he's going to make up his mind about something 99 out of a hundred, it's going to be something that I, I got to side with my guy because his gut is, you know, I trust that just like he trusts mine in, in, in my arena. So yeah, early on when when like we did Suburbia, like because that was the that was the shift right there, the shift in the way he sang, f compared to the upsides. The upsides was oh, the first like shift where the band is like, okay, this is a serious band now. And then when we did Suburbia, I mean, I remember early on the online, not that I have to care about the online thing, but I remember early on, if you guys remember, it's like, Soup sounds really different. I don't know if I like this. And then all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, wow, this is way better. You know, like it was just like there was a shift because, the, the you know, it was he was a young he was younger, yeah. obviously. But there was just this this like power and this passion that really we just with like, obviously, with like I said, we laid down the <laughs> we set the bar right away with the end. It came out swinging like instantly like there it is like so now and then it's only gone up from from there i mean to to the point of like there's so many moments of that on this record you know and even the like you think of um was it cigarettes and saints sure the bury your memory part that like literally soup you know broke down sobbing because it was about his friend like he broke down sobbing after he delivered that line like we just i, I had to like leave him alone for 10 minutes because he was just like a wreck yeah. You know, like in those moments are just like, I, I, I live for those moments that capturing that kind of like just real, you know, catharsis or whatever you want to call it. But just the just and, and those those moments, those special moments on records is what resonates with people, you know, like the, that kind of stuff, leaving the blood on the tracks, so to speak, that I always say, like, that's the stuff that will make always make a memorable record. I'm going to ask you the impossible question right now, Steve. So the hum, the hum is, uh, the hum's out now. So everybody has had a chance to listen to the full, you know, the full weight of it, uh, and will make up ultimately, as we know, their own decisions about it, which has um, been something that we as musicians ha have gotten more and more okay with over the years. Um, it's interesting, but right now, as we track this, what's interesting is over half of the record is still ours, right? It's still yours. It's still ours because we're the only ones that really know it, right? In this moment, before everybody starts to weigh in and before it becomes a different thing in their minds, what's your favorite standout moment? What's that moment for you on this record where you're like, this is exactly where <sighs> I was supposed to be and I know that we have nailed it? Well, the low tide is one. Cardinals two is another one. I mean, there's so there's so many. You got to pick one. You've already said two, so now you get so now you actually have to pick three. You get to pick three, but a third, unless it unless you're going with one of those first two. Okay. Um, well, the end, the last track, the end, the just crescendo of the whole record. That's why I pushed you because I thought you might say that. <laughs> that I mean, that ending is like, ugh, just completely just gut wrenching, so good, and just. I remember tracking the acoustic with you and a lot of that track was already on there. And that is just like, mm -hmm. um, 
tracking a, acoustic with that condenser like an inch from the strings, you can hear me think in there. <laughs> you know, um, you can hear uh -huh. me breathe. I, ha I pulled the in ears in so that there was even less bleed, all that, right? Um, and uh, and that is such a, I thought it was so, uh, I'm glad you said that last song because it gives me a chance to just share what is maybe my favorite moment and or overall track on the record. And it's for that reason because it goes from that tiny, fragile, like holding your breath kind of um, del delicate moment all the way to what it becomes and then back again, uh, which it, it, for me is what I love so much about our band and what I love so much about what we've been able to create uh, with you. So uh, I'm glad you said that and I'm glad mm -hmm. you teed that up because selfishly, yes, I did want to share that, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that ending is like, Whew. Dude, I remember playing it for uh, Jamie Coletta, yeah. and she's literally in tears <laughs> at the end of that. And I, I, I was too, you know, like just, there, and like I said, there's so many moments on this record. Like they've always, they, you guys have always had those moments, but this record is like pretty much just, <laughs> just every song has those moments. There's just like, eh, it's just, yeah, it's wonderful. And, and, and what did we say uh, kind of at the top of this? It's ultimately about finding those moments, right? <laughs> um, is uh, what we kind of, is what we, what we do when we get in there. It is for me, that's for sure. But that, I think that's, that's to me as an artist, that's, that's, that's it. That's always those moments of every classic record that you grew up listening to. There's, there's those moments that you're just like, <sighs> nobody's going to remember a, a, a record that's, track to the grid and auto-tuned and just they're not going to it sucks all the emotion out of everything it sucks all the meaning out of everything it's perfection is in the cracks they might remember it but for a different reason <laughs> they might like it but they're gonna forget it in a week yeah totally it's the it's the small imperfections these records have have endured for a reason. Beautiful note to end it on, Steve. I am so thankful that uh, that you agreed to come chop it up with us, and uh, wow, can't course. wait to get back. Uh, Thank you for having see me. the new dig. Good luck with the new uh, studio space. Where is it? Shout it! I it's so early. I don't even know like where you are in like the naming. I know you're still moving in and, and getting situated, but yeah, I don't know. I haven't figured out a name yet. I'm still like, uh, it's just. It feels so weird. That's like that's like coming up with a band name. It's like the worst. Like, what do you name your studio? Like, what? Yeah. Like, so because I've always worked as uh, on the business side, I've always worked as a sole proprietor. Yep. So I'm actually doing Steve Evans Music LLC. I'm doing so it might just be Steve Evans Music. I feel like it's a little self serving to name the studio after me, but then again, there's other studios that have been named after people as well. So I don't know. I don't hate it by any means. I kind of like it. Yeah, I, I it's don't know. It's a pretty punchy name. Um, if you're listening to this, uh, go find Steve online and give him your name suggestions. Uh, and then, and then, yeah. How about some name suggestions, people? <laughs> I need, some, I need a name for the new name for the studio. It was known as Graphic Nature right. Audio, which was Will Putney's old place. Mm. And before that, it was the Machine Shop, where the producer Machine had yep. the place. So. I'm like the third occupant. <laughs> yeah, dude, some good records. It's got some good energy there. I like that, and I, I love that for you. So go find Steve, give him your best name, and then once the studio is named, uh, you can go and maybe be lucky enough uh, to have Steve um, yell at you to pick better and play faster because <laughs> uh, he loves to. Those are the things he loves to do. <laughs> the studio is in. I'm in Belleville, New Jersey, just outside of Newark. It's a beautiful oh, area. I nice. am only eight and a half miles outside of New York City. It's, I'm so close to the city. It's just wonderful. It's beautiful proximity. Well, congratulations on that, Steve. Uh, the East Coast is is happy and lucky to have you again. Uh, you're not too far from True Level, so I'm sure you'll be seeing some of Tom as well, hopefully. Absolutely. Once again, uh, friend, uh, friend of friends, um, producer, engineer extraordinaire, Steve Evitz. Thank you, buddy. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you, guys. So this episode really got me thinking, thinking about the fact that plans change, 
I'm sure everyone listening can quickly call to mind a few projects or goals that were greatly affected in some way over the last few years of navigating the phases of this pandemic. And it was a blast to talk to Steve about the moments that stuck with him the most while making this record and how he was able to recognize the moments that would hit the hardest even before a note had been tracked. But more than anything, what I loved about this conversation, walking back through the making of this album, which was a process that started over two years ago now, is how it reminds me precisely why I am so proud to be a part of this band and to make music with people like Steve. Maybe more so than any other point in our career, I'm so incredibly proud of our willingness to stand up and face whatever creative or logistical challenge was in front of us, our willingness to lean into each other and the people that we trust, and just figure it the hell out. The goal was always to make something that felt useful, something that felt true to who we have become as musicians over 17 plus years as a band, and something that we could stand behind for years to come. If we were going to make another record, we felt like we owed it to ourselves and to the people that have supported us to bring something genuine, something personal, and as always, something authentically Wonder Years. So when we got the masters back for this record, I think it became abundantly clear to us all that we have figured out exactly what that means. So I'm really grateful that this show gave me a chance to share some of that discovery with you. And I hope you can find it useful in your own practice in some way. And thank you again for spending your time with us here on The Record Process.